Well, good morning. It is so wonderful to be with you this morning, and I hope you're going to enjoy our uh, service today. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not as uh, dynamic as some of our others, but we'll take on with it. Let's go ahead and begin this morning with our first songs. We have two songs. You can stay seated when you're going through it. We have the first two verses of All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name and the first two verses of Shall We Gather at the River. All right, let us all assume a posture of prayer and begin with our prayer of the day. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, and in your name be known throughout the earth through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance, and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on your own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. 
we abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with you through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because your love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, before we enter into the morning prayer, are there any prayer concerns from the congregation? Almost too much light. <laughs> okay. Seeing none, the, the prayer is printed in your bulletin, but uh, uh, we'll go ahead and, and pray together. So if you would bow your heads and we'll, we'll join in the morning prayer. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, you gather the church to be part of your mission as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. As Jesus acknowledged the great faith of a woman from outside his people, help your church discover and finding blessing in the faith of people we might reject. You call the nations to be glad and sing for joy. Let your way be known among all the nations of the world, now divided by competing interests, contending alliances, and consuming by enormous worry. Bless us and make your face shine upon all. You show unexpected mercy, kindness, and generosity. We pray for those who do not have enough, for outcasts in our villages, cities, and towns, and for those who need your healing. In you, we live and move and have our being. Grant our church, Zion, grace to find our life refreshed in you. Accompany us in the rhythms of late summer. Give us rest and renewal, and strengthen us for mission in your name. Your eternal promises are more than we could ever imagine. As you gather all the saints, you join us also with them in the great day of your salvation. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
first lesson this morning is from Genesis 35, verses 1 through 15. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before, before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Send everyone away from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him. So dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, while Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. The psalm today is Psalm 133, and the refrain is, Good and pleasant it is dwelling in unity. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. Good and pleasant it is dwelling in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down over the collar of his robes. <clears throat> it is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. And the second lesson today is from Romans, chapter 11. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy, because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. 
For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. You may remain seated for the reading of the gospel. The gospel this morning is from St. Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sorry, we chose some new songs this time, and if you notice, they're not to the rhythm that, or the melody that's in your hymnal. And that is because that melody is even harder than the one that Pastor Bill helped us select. However, the songs themselves all relate to the message of today, so I apologize in advance for giving you one more after the message. Okay. So rules. I know, that's not a real topic that we find really entertaining or even engaging. All right, but let's follow along on a really interesting journey through our scripture lessons this week. And I'm not sure if you know this or not, but all of you can get a preface of what's coming up if you go and look at the Revised Common Lectionary, just put in your search engine, Revised Common Lectionary, it's hosted at Vanderbilt, so you'll see vanderbilt.edu as the site. Don't go to any other one, go to that one. Or go to some of the other ones, I don't know if they're safe or not, but this one I know is safe. And see what's coming up. In fact, if you want an interesting Bible study lesson, go ahead and read next week before next Sunday, and ask yourself, what is the thread that we can go through? Then read the scripture and try and figure out what next week's sermon message is going to be. Because each of us are going to read the same passages and find different threads and scripture messages 
that will come to us. And that's really the challenge. And I don't know if it, how many of you have watched the virtual service? Have you noticed that in the virtual service we don't, uh, or I add things to it, like you see pictures and you see parts of the verses up on the screen as we go through that. Now, Pastor Bill does not tell me what he's going to put in his message. So the game we play is the same game I'm challenging you to play. What pictures, what things do you think need to go with the message as you read it? And you'll find that once you start playing this little game, you're going to find new things when you're reading it. You're going to see different messages that can pop out at you. So try it for a week or three, and then it'll become fun, and you'll say, oh, I can do this. I can really learn from that. Um, as I give you that challenge, it is not inconsequential. It's the same challenge I give us during the weekly Bible studies that we have uh, as we're going through. I've got to make my script move a little faster. I'll take a second and stop. I have a big teleprompter. Can you read it from there, Dewey? Dewey might even be able to read it from there, right? We'll, we'll, we'll take that part of it out as we're going through, right? So we have this big teleprompter, and it's very important that I actually follow the script, because if I don't and do like I'm doing now, we're going to be here for 30 minutes instead of 19, which is what the lesson was designed for. So anyway, that's why I have to do it this way. <laughs> yeah. Most definitely. All right. So let's start out in Genesis. Right? And you just saw that message come out the screen. How did that apply to rules? This is Joseph in Egypt with his brothers, and he's crying, and, and he's welcoming them. You need to know when it started. So let's go back a few verses before, and you're going to find out that until you step a little closer and look at the past, we don't really get an understanding of what this message was just up there. So, what did his brothers do? Well, they were set out to kill him. Right? They wanted just to plain out kill him. And Reuben said, no, 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 let's not do that. Let's throw him in the cistern instead. Well, Reuben knew the cistern was dry, and he planned on secretly coming back after where they'd all left and rescuing him and bringing him back to his father. But then his plans were interrupted, and a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming by, and they sold Joseph to those Ishmaelites. They were, Midi they were Midianites, exactly, for 20 pieces of silver. I want to stop right there. 20 pieces of silver. Is that some number that you've heard before or thought about before? There's a whole other sermon on 20 pieces of silver happening here in Genesis and again in the New Testament because who received 20 pieces of silver Judas, exactly. So anyway, what did the brothers do after that? Well, they dipped his cloak in, and remember that was the cloak of many colors? They dipped it into goat's blood, took it to his father, and said, the beast got him, right? So I'm going to ask you, how many of God's rules did the brothers break? And yes, this is a trick question. Did those rules exist in written form at the time the brothers broke them? No, because this is hundreds of years before Moses. But did the rules exist even then? Was it unusual for people to sell their family members into slavery? No, it happened all the time. And, and it happened much longer than what you're seeing as you're going through. 
So, what was the state of those brothers in God's eyes? Were they favorable or unfavorable? All right, so the brothers now had to live with the fact that they did this to Joseph, and probably most of them forgot about it for years. So what did Joseph do? Well, he had his ups and downs and everything else in Egypt, right? But eventually, because of his interpretation, he was made the vizier. What's the vizier? Well, we know that as the prime minister of a country. Okay? The brothers were desperate. Two years in a famine. No food. The famine was everywhere. They went to Egypt to beg for some food. And they were brought in front of Joseph. They didn't recognize him because Joseph was out of their memory. He was dead. And then Joseph said, clear them all out. And only his brothers were in front of the prime minister. The prime minister has the ability to say off with their heads, and their heads would be off. How would you feel now in front of the prime minister, and you cleared the room, and then he says, I am your brother Joseph. How do you feel now? Absolutely terrified. <laughs> Oh my gosh, we sold him into slavery. We were going to kill him. And what does Joseph do? He forgives them. He says, I am here because of God's plan. Are you seeing the rules? God has the rules. God knew this was coming up. He had to preserve his chosen people, which is what Israel would come from. All of his, the 12 tribes were his brothers. They were all part of the same group. So the rules were in place even before God gave them to the in tablet form. Joseph himself is what we call a type of Christ, and you see that throughout the Old Testament. One of the things we're going to be doing in our weekly Bible studies is when we get to the Old Testament, we're going to look for where are the types or pictures of Christ in each of those stories. Where are the direct foreshadowings of Christ in each of those tales that we read about in the Old Testament. So we've already said that all of this happened before the law was given to Moses. Again, we're seeing God's rules at work. Joseph identified them immediately. He knew this was God's plan, and there it goes. If we move on to the Psalms, what did it say? Do you remember? Because we all had to say that. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. So I'm going to ask you, how much unity have we seen in the Bible, in our own experiences, in the world outside these four walls? And yet, that psalmist was absolutely correct thousands of years ago, and it still holds true for us today. When we are in unity, we are working toward a common vision. And I can see all of you out there now saying, how does that apply to rules? So I'm going to ask you, how can you get everyone to live together in unity? How does any society live together in harmony? Because we have rules, we have laws, we have accepted behavior that we all agree to. It's a common structure so that we know if we follow this, we can get along together and we can be in harmony and in unity. Okay, quick jump again. Now let's go to Romans. Now I know you can't find where are the rules in the Romans passage because there can't be any. Uh, and I'm going to say yes, it is. Has God rejected his people? By his people, I mean everybody. And there's where you see the difference in Romans. Prior to what we see today in our scripture, Jesus was exclusively dealing with Jews. And Romans tells us now that 
someone outside of the Jewish community is now included in the mercy of God. So if we look at it, what has God done to us from Romans? It said, we're all disobedient towards God. He has imprisoned that disobedience so that he may show mercy to us all. Okay, that's not in the rules before because the rules only apply to Jews, not to the Gentiles. We're all good with that, right? The rules apply to the Jews, not to the Gentiles. Yet why are we all looking at that here? So I ask you, what is the penalty for breaking God's rule? What's the penalty for breaking the rule? The wages of sin is death. There we go. What does death mean? I fall over and I'm out of my physical body? No, death means separation from God eternally, right? When we die physically, our spiritual selves ascend to heaven. That's what we hope, anyway. That's why we're all here in church. That's why we're believers. But our, something goes, the rest of us doesn't die. Our spirit does not die when our physical form dies. Yet, if we're all sinful, when we're judged, what happens to that spirit? It is eternally separated from God. You will not be in God's presence anymore as you're going through that. So when I was getting ready to look at this, I'm going, okay, how does all this tie in together to what we saw in Matthew? And what we read today in Matthew is just a small portion of today's reading. It actually should have started back on verse 10, and you see two different stories that come together. And I'm going to go all the way back to verse 1. Okay? God has how many plans for us? It has, we always say God has a plan. And we forget that little word, a. Not God has many plans. A plan. One plan. Plan, one way for us to be saved. One way for us to gain his mercy. See the tie in the Romans? One plan. That's all we have, right? And how do we know that's true? Because it's not just Fred saying that. What did Christ say? He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through him. Okay, so now on to the meat and potatoes of of Matthew. So back on the first verse, and we're going to go all the way through verse 28. But I'm going to do it rather quickly. Verses 1 through 9, we can see that Jesus and the Pharisees are engaged in a controversy. It's important for us to know that. These Pharisees came to Jerusalem, or came from Jerusalem, to Galilee. That's kind of like the president coming to visit us here in Attico. It's just not going to happen. So here we have the Pharisees in Galilee talking with Jesus. But did they come to Jesus? They came to see what this guy was all about, but they came to find fault in him, not even to listen to what was going on. They were very critical of him and his disciples for failing to wash their hands. Stop there for just a second. <laughs> In today's context, don't wash those hands. Oh my gosh. I'm going to commit you. That's the ultimate atrocity. And that's how those Pharisees were responding. Does everyone know who the Pharisees are and the Sadducees and the scribes? They were the leaders, they had the law, they created the law, they talked about the law, and we're going to hit that in just a few seconds. But it's very interesting for us to see that they were more worried about breaking a hand-washing rule 
than listening to the Son of God or even listening to the message as Jesus was talking about. And that's kind of where they were. And that was because of their mindset. They were coming to find fault. They weren't coming to get understanding. They were coming to find fault. So what did Jesus do? Well, he quoted Isaiah 29, 13 to them. You hypocrites! Right? Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines rules made by men. Okay, so now we start seeing the why I chose rules as today's title, right? How many of you think that all the rules that the Pharisees, Sadducees, the scribes had put on the people of Israel were motivated by good, good rationale, right? No. Well, they thought so, because they were trying to add clarity to what God told them. Well, you know, he had this rule, but... I can add to it and make other things so it's more clear for you and easier for you to follow. Okay? So they wanted to get every single scenario you might find in your daily life documented in the rules. And they developed the Mishnah and the Talmud. The Mishnah was done from 200 B.C. to about 135 A.D. So even after Christ was here, they continued to add to those rules. And the Talmud was from 250 to 500 A.D., after Christ was here. So now here's the trivia question of the day. If you put them all together, how many pages of rules will you find in the Mishnah and the Talmud? How many pages of rules? Throw out some numbers. Oh, no, it's much more than that. Any guesses? I know, I know that Jared knows. How many pages? 36,000 pages of rules. Okay, so how did we get that number? We actually learned about this last Wednesday, so I, they, he knew. And Shirley knows, and Judy knew, would know, so if they were here, they could all yell it out for you. How do we get that number? Well, if we actually take a look, uh, we're told that by Herbert Locke here in Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, page 1029. So if you want to look it up yourself, you actually can. It's amazing how many resources we have to use in order to come together to make one sermon message, I tell you. It's, it's a fun path along, all right? So all these rules were helpful, supposedly. But the problem was, they wanted to be all-inclusive. So they took and expanded the law that God gave them, the real rules, well beyond its original intent. In some cases, they took a rule intended for a specific group, like the priests, and they tried to apply it to everyone. Or they took a rule applicable to a specific situation during Passover, and they expanded it to cover all situations. Right? So they went into nearly infinite detail on what you can do and what you can't do. Any guesses as how many Jews actually were able to follow those rules? Zero. Goose said, right? There's no possible way. Even if you studied them all the time, can you memorize 36,000 pages and know exactly which rule applied to which situation? No. If I wanted to, if they wanted to do things to you for breaking a rule, it was very easy for them to find witnesses and to say, you broke this rule, stone him. So whatever the situation would be, they can find that. Now you can see what was going on in the religious patriarchy of the time. So they were giving us those rules, and they were trying to do that. So Jesus when he replied back to those Pharisees, really offended them. Okay? And then he starts to go on a little bit more. Instead of, his disciples tried to warn him, hey, did you realize what you just did? That was very offensive to them. And he doubles down. He goes, hear and understand. 
That which enters the mouth doesn't defile the man, but that which proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. Now the disciples were looking at him sideways saying, what is going on? Why are you doing this? And then he says, additionally, every plant which my heavenly Father didn't plant will be uprooted. Leave them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. If the blind guide the blind, both will fall into the pit. So the first thing, he offended the Pharisees over the hand washing. Now he just went and told them he, he didn't care about their dietary rules. But he told them, the disciples, these Pharisees are blind. They don't understand what's going on. They don't see the bigger picture, and therefore the blind are leading the blind, which is the rest of the Jewish community. So when we're looking at that back and forth, we're now saying, oh my. What happens shortly afterward? These same Pharisees meet him again in Jerusalem. They, they were offended and put out because of what he said before. Their rage against him was now much, much greater. Time had gone on, they continued to stew over it. Their rage was going to get much greater. So rather than talk about the Pharisees and the hand washing and why their rule didn't fit, he just basically said, all of you are the blind leading the blind. And he turns away. So he just had this. And you're going, why does it matter over the dietary rules? Well, it is really important for us to understand that the Jews of the time, because of their dietary rules and restrictions, set themselves apart from the rest of civilization that was around them. The Gentiles didn't follow the rules. They were better in God's eyes because they followed the rules that God had given them by following the dietary restrictions. So they were following the rules. They were better, more noble. They were more pure. And the Gentiles were the dogs of the world. They were not worthy of being in our company. And if you saw what was going on in society at the time, that is exactly how they were treated. Right? So you're seeing all these tie-ins come from all the way back from Joseph's time and the Romans and the, we saw the stuff from the Psalms. And then we get into this week understanding. What do we have? We had a Canaanite woman. Do you know who Canaanites are? There's another way to pronounce it, by the way. It could be a Canaanite. That's too hard for me to say. Canaanite's much easier. But you'll find that. Who are these people? Well, they're Gentiles, right? What do we know about Gentiles? Well, they're the dogs. They're less than us. We're the upright. These Gentiles, we go right. And what did this woman do? What did she say? Have mercy on me, Lord. And she's on her knees. Lord. Son of David, my daughter is tormented by a demon. So what did Jesus do? You know, he's a really nice guy. What did he do? Well, absolutely nothing. But she continues, right? Right? Okay, so I'm going to go back just a second. This outsider is not in the Jewish fold. And Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Meaning all of those people that are no longer following the Pharisees, or that are following the Pharisees, no longer following the rules of God. He was sent for them. But this Canaanite woman, she doesn't give up. He goes, right? So he says, I was sent only to, by the lost sheep. But she continues in front of him. 
says, Lord, help me. And he says, it's not fair for me to take from the children's food, the people of Israel, and throw it to the dogs. Do you now see the reference? Why would he say throw it to the dogs? Well, the Gentiles were the dogs of society. They were beneath the very part and, and, and notice of the Jews. And how did she respond? Right? She says, well, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Here is a Canaanite woman, a Gentile, not a Jew, who already recognized that, one, he was Lord, he was the Savior, he was the son of David. If you looked at that within the Jewish society, if you use those terms, it means you were addressing the Messiah. A Gentile recognized him as being the Messiah, and the Pharisees and scribes, moments before, were arguing and criticizing and trying to find fault. And that is where the message comes in. So what, how did he respond? Well, I can imagine this. I, I can imagine a big smile coming across his face because he says, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Right? So if we take a look at this, what exactly did he do? Well, he saved the Gentiles. How many Gentiles are in, are in Jesus' history, his ancestry? Anyone? Hmm. Do we remember who they were? I'll give you one. Rahab. Who's the other one? Ruth. Both of those individuals were in his ancestry coming up into Mary. So we had two Gentiles. Now remember... <laughs> They shouldn't have been dealing with the people of Israel even as they were, and they had to fight in order to become part of the community as it went through. So we know that Jesus had Gentiles in his own line. And what we're seeing is those mercies and gifts that God bestowed upon us were not limited to just being Jewish. Now you see the Romans tie in? The mercies that God has for all. All of us are disobedient, we already know that. But all of us can receive his mercy. So how do we do that? Because as Gentiles, we do not follow the rules of the Jewish people. Right? We follow the rules of God, we follow the rules of man, we follow the way that, you know, the rules of man interact with the rules of God, and we end up disobeying them all. Because we're human. How did this Canaanite woman approach Christ in humility. She didn't say, I'm greater than you. I didn't find faults. She says, I have all the faults in the world. And she was on her knees and she was worshiping Christ. She had the humility that Jesus was looking for for all of us when we approach him because she recognized that it requires mercy and grace in order for her to get what she needed for her daughter. Right? So Jesus is Lord and Savior for all. And if any of us wish eternal life, we have how many ways to get there? One. See, you are listening. See, you guys up front, you can't tell. I got people in the back that are going to me. Yeah, they're, they're telling me the answers as we're going through. Right? So there is only one way. And we have to acknowledge that, and we have to believe in him, and you have to believe it within your heart. You have to be the one that comes up and says, there is one way for salvation. All of us, we can lead everyone else to Christ. We can show them the reasons. We can give you the logical parts of it. I can show you the scriptures, but you have one way to get to Christ. One rule that you must follow. There are lots of rules that we have to follow, but there's one rule that you must follow because you're going to break all the others. One way for salvation. 
You have to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You have to believe it in your heart. So what are you going to do after you do that? Because now you're saved. What's the next step? Here's the second rule. You need to start behaving like Christ. And I will tell you for a fact that I try that every single day, and I fail every single day. But the neat thing about God is he lets us sleep and start over tomorrow. Right? We have to have the perseverance of that Canaanite woman. The humility to say, I screwed it up yesterday. Let me try and be better today. Why do you need to emulate Christ in your lives? Because you are going to meet other people who have not accepted Christ into their lives. And it is your abilities to follow Christ, to demonstrate what Christ believes, to demonstrate how to deal with other people, to try and maintain unity among us that will give them the desire to look further into this. You cannot save a single person, but you can provide an example for all persons Oh, so this is what being that Christian thing is all about. And you thought that those songs that we selected had nothing to do with today. How I want to be a Christian. And how is it to be a Christian as you're going forward? So the answer is real simple. You've got one set of rules to follow. And it's one rule. I think even I can follow that one and not break it. Because... As long as you accept him in your life and you say, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, you are the way for me to have eternal life, and then I, in my joy, am going to try to emulate you every single day. I will get angry, I will do other things, I will screw up every single day, but it doesn't matter, Jesus has still saved me. I can be as bad as I want. You can do this conversion two minutes, two seconds before you die. And it's still good. All we can do is emulate Christ for everyone else to follow. And that is today's message. And all I say to that is, amen. I can do this. We can all do this. So please stand and say the Apostles' Creed with me. I know the only reason I'm having you stand is to put some blood flow into your legs. Guys, I need the creed up. Because I may have it memorized, but not when you're standing up here talking. Yo, advance the slide. Thank you. I put him to sleep. I'm sorry. It was too deep. All right, let's get back into it. And here's the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. Conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Our final song is a new one for us, as I told you before, but it's really, really fitting with our message. Um, This is the day of new beginnings. We'll be singing verses 1 and 4, not 1 and 2. They're up on the screen for you. Every day as as Christians is a day of new beginnings. It's up to us to remember and to live and for it to be that way.
pipe it over the top of this. But did you read the words? The words were what was so important as we're going through. This is a day of new beginning, and in that like mind. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. To be gracious to you, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.